We're looking this morning at Genesis chapter 24. Quite a number of scriptures this morning, but uh, sometimes it's good if we read a whole story and, and see how God works. So let's begin here in Genesis 24 verse 1. It says, Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall t not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow, me, follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me, and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink and I will water your camels also, may she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. And she went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. She quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for a wrist weighing ten shekels in gold and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Again she said to him, We have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Then the man bowed low and worshipped the Lord. He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaking, forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master as for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. When he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me, he went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. And he said, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? And said, Prepare the house and a place for the camels. So the man entered the house. Then Laban unloaded the camels and gave strong feed to the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. But when food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told you my business. And he said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master so that he has become rich and has given him flocks and herds 
and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Suppose the woman does not follow me. He said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful. You will take a wife for my son, for my relatives, and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my relatives, and if they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. So I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will make my journey on which I go successful, behold, I am standing by the spring, and may it be that the maiden who comes out to draw, to whom I say, Please let me drink a little water from your jar, and she will say to me, You drink, and I will draw for your candles also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring and drew. And I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed low and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. So if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, let me know, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you good or bad or good. Here is Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate, drank, and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days, say ten. Afterward she may get. He said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah arose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac had come from going to Bir Lahai Roy, where he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to, the, to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things he had done, that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, such an old story, Lord, and really a beautiful story. Father, we don't fully understand it in our culture, but we pray, Lord, that today you would speak to us from it, Lord, that you'd teach us about how we're to behave concerning you, and you'd teach us about how you want to direct us and love us and, and help us in our lives. And so we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'd like to say to start off with, you know, it's very unusual for us today to think about somebody walking up to another guy and, and putting his hand under his thigh, you know, to make this arrangement. And uh, some of us fellows would probably feel kind of uncomfortable about it today, wouldn't we? If we were honest. But you think about... You know, the reason why we're uncomfortable is because it's, 
you know, it's kind of, for us guys, you, you're getting a little too close, right? But I, I think it speaks of the intimacy that God wants to have with us. And we need to understand that, that God wants to be close. And really, when it comes to God, we're kind of okay with that, you know? When it comes to another fellow, us guys, you know, aren't, aren't so, so keen on the idea in our culture. But we need to understand it, I think, in that light, that it's God wanting to be uh, close to us. And there are a lot of other reasons we may have difficulty with this story, because uh, really the setting here is so far removed from our own culture, uh, not just the idea of, of placing your hand under someone's thigh to make an oath. Uh, back in Abraham's day, for a man to arrange a marriage for his son, even through a third party, was the rule of the day, not the exception. You know, for us, that you know, it doesn't usually happen that way. Uh, Eliezer, Abraham's steward here, was in charge, it tells us, of all of Abraham's affairs. He was answerable only to the master, Abraham. Uh, in Egypt, you recall, Joseph became Potiphar's steward. And Jesus told the story about a, a certain rich man who had a steward who was accused of wasting his goods over in Luke 16.1. Today, the word steward, it's used to describe a Christian's relationship to Christ. As our master, he has entrusted to us as, as his stewards a, a portion of his goods to manage for his best interests. We're stewards of what we have, not owners. Unfortunately, we kind of mess that up sometimes. We think, you know, it's all ours. You know, that's my stuff. That's my bank account, right? But we need to understand it's not ours. It's God's. And we're, we're but a steward of it. And, and we're to take care of it. Uh, and, and our first concern should be the success of our master's affairs. In this beautiful story about Abraham's commission to his steward and, and then Eliezer's uh, faithful service, I, I'm discovering six marks of a steward that I'd like us to look at today. First of all, number one, stewards are persons who've been taken into their master's confidence and entrusted with his affairs. Uh, now that Abraham was old in our story here, he was more and more dependent on this steward, uh, Eliezer of Damascus. Uh, having made him uh, the promise with this oath that he wouldn't take a wife for his son Isaac from the Canaanites, a Abraham then directs him, you know, go back to where I'm from. Go, go back to home, you know, my home origin and to Mesopotamia where some of, of the descendants of his brother uh, Nahor still lived in order to seek out a wife uh, for Isaac among, from among his kinsmen. Now, that brings up issues for us, you know, the, the family relationship there that we won't look at today. Uh, we just need to understand this was acceptable in this culture and in that day. Uh, Abraham was, was old. He was dependent on this trusted servant. But remember, God is not old. He's timeless because he lives in eternity. He doesn't live in time. You know, we think about you know age in a whole lot different way than what God would. He, to, to, to get rid of time is a concept that just boggles our minds. You know, I've tried thinking about it and uh, I have to stop after a while because my, my head hurts after just a little while. I'm trying to figure out what would it be like that we're in eternity, there is no time, Distance has become unimportant because we're separated. You know, if there's no time, then it doesn't take time to get somewhere because there isn't any time. Does that make sense? Not really. Not when, you, when you're tied to time, it doesn't make any sense. It just boggles your mind. But uh, God is not old. All that to say that God is not old. Uh, and neither is He dependent on us, yet He trusts us. And, and He takes us into His confidence and he puts things uh, under our responsibility. He's placed a portion of his goods in our hands. And he has done this because he has faith in us. That should boggle your mind even more. 
We have faith in God, or we say we do, but here is a very sobering thought. God has faith in us. How tragic if we don't prove true to that trust. What of, of God has He placed in our hands as Temple Baptist Church? And then be careful here, I might preach a little bit. What of God God's has He placed in your hands as a, a child of God? Everything we are, everything we have, God has given to us. And He's placed that in your hands. He's placed things in my hands. He's placed things in our hands as a church. And we're responsible for them. Secondly, this morning, stewards are persons who share their master's faith and methods of operation. Eliezer's story here teaches us a, a lot about God's guidance of his servants. Eliezer was, was one whom God could guide. Why? Well, because he'd absorbed something of his master's faith and he imitated his master's method. Did, did you notice that as we heard the story? He operated in the same spirit and in the same manner that Abraham would operate in. And we need to do the same thing. We need to operate as Christ would operate. He's our master and we're to be Christ-like, which is what Christian means. Uh, as, as Eliezer had faith in, in his master, we're to have faith in Jesus Christ. We're not to operate in the spirit of the world or to use worldly methods. We're to use God's methods. Several years ago, a church in Tennessee, a Tennessee town, got permission to put up paper mache toll booths on the main highway coming into town and to make the last five miles of their highway coming into town into a, a toll booth. Now that's a real toll booth, but theirs was, was made out of paper. Uh, every dollar that was given uh, brought those paper mache toll booths closer, nearer to town. Uh, and, and the, the idea that they, they estimated the length of what $50,001 bills pinned end to end would be, and that was the amount they were trying to raise. So they, they started out there, you know, that five miles. And then as they, they got money, they moved the tollbos closer to town. And uh, that's how they were raising money. Every dollar given brought those booze a little bit closer to town. And, and no doubt, some of those people coming into town, hit up for a dollar, wondered if they weren't being stopped by Jesse James and his gang rather than representatives of the church. That is not the method churches should use in case anybody's getting any ideas. All right? God doesn't want us to get money that way. He just doesn't. Uh, he, he expects us to, to tithe. He expects us to be stewards in that way. Uh, and I think the reason is those kinds of methods really don't show faith in God and aren't done in the spirit of Christ. Thirdly, we should learn that stewards are, are, are persons who combine faith and common sense in serving their master. Each step that Abraham's steward took was taken with fellowship in God. Did you notice that? He, when the servant hesitated saying, you know, what if this woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Abraham assured him, you know, and... and uh, that didn't prevent the steward from, from weighing carefully the, the steps that he should take. You know, he was, he was very much common sense oriented, thinking everything through, and, and he combined his faith with his common sense. Realizing that, that he uh, reached the village in, in Haran where Abraham's rel relatives lived, uh, uh, once he got there, he realized that. He's like, okay, well, the girls are probably going to come out for to get water for the evening. And, and so uh, he, he had his 10 camels kneel down there and sat himself right there at the village well, waiting for that to happen. And uh, as soon as they appeared to draw water, he, you know, he had his plan. You know, he's asking himself, okay, how am I gonna know which is the right girl to pick? And, and he wanted a, a chance to study kind of the disposition and character of this girl. and. And that he was going to choose for his 
his uh, master's son's wife. And of course, Rebecca was the first one to appear. And uh, uh, she did exactly what he prayed to God that the right person would do, you know. Uh, she offered to water these ten thirsty camels. Can you imagine drawing water for ten camels, first of all? Okay? It might take a couple gallons to put in a, in a car that was totally dry. I don't know how many gallons a, 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 cam, a thirsty camel can drink, but I bet they can drink more than a couple gallons, don't you? But, so she took on a big job there. That, that spoke of her character and the kind of young woman she was. Uh, whatever may be the final word about Rebecca and her brother Laban, Eliezer combined faith and common sense in the right proportions in making this choice. Why should we not be as careful to combine our faith and our common sense? They don't really conflict. Some people think they do, but they don't conflict. They go together and complement with one another. They're allies. Next, fourthly, stewards are... are people who are zealous about their master's business. They're anxious to do it. When, when Eliezer had been uh, taken into his master's confidence, he entered into this very highly sensitive and delicate matter with as much zeal and enthusiasm as, as if it was his own son that he was getting a, a wife for. He didn't delay, it says, to begin, but he began organizing his caravan and he started out as soon as that was ready. Uh, when he arrived in the city of Nahor, he didn't spend, you know, 10 days touring the city just to kind of see the lay of the land. No, he, he, he began his search immediately. After he had been received into Rebekah's home, he refused the meal until he had conducted his business. Did you notice that? He got right to business. And when Rebekah's mother and brother tried to delay her departure... Ten days after it was agreed that she'd go the next day, he replied, Do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And when it was left to Rebecca, of course, again showing that he had picked the right girl, her character, you know, she saw God in that. He told the story of, of how he had asked God to reveal the right person to him and and I think she saw that, you know, that was God's working. And so she immediately agreed to go. Oh, that we would be equally as intent on our master's business. Amen. That we would be as involved and anxious to, to see what God would do. We also see here, stewards are our people who manage to speak of their master and not of themselves. Whenever they got the opportunity. Count the number of times that this worthy man uses the words, my master here. I mean, he makes it clear from the first to the last that this mission is not his own. It is his master's, but he's brought into it. Some of Jesus' disciples, of course, called him Rabboni, the affectionate term for my master. If only we would also make it clear whose we are and whom we serve, whose business we're about. You know, we're Christ, and, and the work of, of Christianity is His. He's our master, and that work is ours as well. And, and, and as a boy of only 12, you remember Jesus was already conscious of His stewardship to His Father. You remember when His parents lost Him in Jerusalem, and it, you, you expect that probably Mary and Joseph, when they realized He was gone, looked at each other at the same time and said, but I thought He was with you. Ever had that happen? <laughs> Lose a child? I thought you had. And, uh, and then when they found him, the Bible says it like this in Luke 2, 49. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? You know, this just makes sense. So that's what we should be about. So must we all be about our father's business. And, and everyone should expect that that's what we're doing. Finally, this morning, stewards are people who plead for success in their master's name, not their own. When Eliezer prayed that God would give him good speed in his mission, he alleged it as his plea that this would be showing kindness to his master Abraham. As Abraham's steward, this man was really one with his master, wasn't he? You know, Abraham's interests and concerns were his interests and concerns. And he 
busied himself about accomplishing it, then that should be our approach to stewardship as well. Our, our master's interests, his concerns should be ours. We, we shouldn't hesitate to ask great things of God if we plead in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and if we do so, we can be sure that he'll show kindness to us for Jesus' sake. There are two approaches to time and talent, possessions and money. The owner approach, you can take that track, or you can take the steward approach, stewardship approach. When, when we take the owner approach, we're estranged and alienated from God and from other people. But when we take Eliezer's approach, the stewardship approach, we're united to God, we're united to others, and you work together. This account here in, in Genesis is, is a very beautiful lesson for all of us who call Jesus Master and Lord. And if He's your Lord, then you're His steward. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, It is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Trustworthy. May God help us to be trustworthy stewards. There was a, a farmer, I've told you about this before, a farmer needed a hired man, and after trying several workers, all of them who failed to meet his standards, the farmer began to kind of feel desperate, and then another worker applied for the job, and, and the farmer asked him, what do you think qualifies you for this job? And his answer was, well, I can sleep at night. That didn't really sound too promising to the farmer, but he was desperate. He'd kind of run through all the other potential people who could work for him. So he decided, well, I'll give this guy a chance, and he hired this newcomer. That night, there was a terrific thunderstorm, and, and the farmer woke up, ran to the hired man's room, tried to arouse him, but couldn't wake him up. Try as he might, not impossible. Uh, completely impossible to wake him up, and, and so kind of muttering to himself something like, well, I'll take care of him in the morning, you know, thinking he's going to have to fire him. He went outside into the night, out in the driving rain. He found the barn doors securely closed, the haystack was well covered, the tractor was put away in the shed. There was nothing he could do but go back to his house, go to bed, and as he got back there, he began to understand why his new hired man had said, well, I can sleep at night. Because he took care of all the requirements. Anything could happen to be all right. He didn't leave anything out. Nothing was left in a dangerous condition. Everything was as it should be. Isn't it comforting to know that when we're prepared for Jesus coming, by faithfully doing the things the Lord has made clear to us that we should be doing, He'll take care of those things that are beyond our control. Oh, that we would be that kind of steward. We're going to sing a song this morning, Make Me a Blessing. We have to submit to that for God to make us a blessing. We have to uh, be a good steward about it and trust Him. Maybe you need to make a decision for the Lord this morning. I'll be here to receive you as we're singing. But every single one of us needs to, to stop a minute this morning and commit to the Lord. Lord, I want to be your steward. I want to be like Eliezer and, and be the best servant that I can be and have the kind of zeal I need to have and the kind of enthusiasm about your work. Lord, just renew that in me. Uh, maybe you once had that kind of enthusiasm, but it's kind of waned. So let's recommit ourselves to the Lord this morning as we stand together and sing this song.